All right. You can have a seat. And the first John chapter five, verse 21 is the verse that we're going to focus our thoughts on. Uh, notice it. First John 5, 21. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. And then he closes the book with that. So be it. <laughs> Amen. When you think of idols, what comes to your mind? Maybe ancient statues of wood or stone or metal, some type of material like the ancient Israelites worshipped at times. Or perhaps you think of a fat Buddha sitting in a lotus position. Or maybe you think of a Hindu goddess, uh, Vishnu, with numerous arms extending out of her body. Or maybe you think of Roman Catholic statue, statues of Mary or one of the saints. I remember when I was a boy, all good Catholics had a statue of St. Christopher on their dashboard of their uh, 1950s or 1960s model car. Uh, that was supposed to protect them. That statue was an idol that uh, was supposed to protect them when they were on the road driving. Trouble is, I saw them in wrecked vehicles as much as I did in unwrecked vehicles. Those are all examples of idols, obviously. But I'd like to just take a few minutes and identify idols that even some Christians fall into worshiping. But I think before we can do that, we have to arrive at a definition as to what is an idol? How do you define idolatry? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are thankful that we can take this time together and just think through, though briefly it may be, these thoughts that you challenge us with as you close this letter. Spirit of God, you say, Keep yourselves from idols. Well, help us to figure out what an idol is so that we can identify them and then evade them. Thank you so much for this time in your word and for the simple and yet powerful truths that you give to us. We praise you for it. And we are dependent upon the enabling spirit of God in us. And we ask, Father, that you as a good heavenly father would give the spirits enablement and we take and we thank you that you always undertake for us as we ask it for the sake of Jesus. Amen. So I would define idolatry in three main ways. Number one, idolatry involves worship. And you know, the truth of the matter is that whether you are saved or not, whether you are a believer or a pagan, every human, if you're an atheist, every human being worships something or someone. Without exception, I can say that. You know why? Because we, believe it or not, we are God imagers created by God in his image to reflect him. And as such, we've been created to be worshipers, obviously created to be worshipers of the one true and living God. But if any human being, like Adam and Eve did in the Garden of Eden, choose themselves over God, then we will end up as individuals worshiping at the altar of self-interest instead of at the feet of Jesus. You want to define idolatry. Number one, it's worship. Number two, it pertains to value. You worship what you value the most. The things that are most important to you, the things that you want most in life, the things that you will do anything for in order to have them. What you choose to spend your time, your energy, and your ability and your possessions to pursue after or to achieve, that's what's of value to you. So idolatry involves worship, it involves value, and thirdly, it involves dependence. 
what you worship, what you value the most, what you value, what you value the most, what you look to, what you value the most is what you look to in order to meet whatever need you might have. That's what you depend upon. Uh, the thing that takes the place of God in your heart. It can be an inanimate object. It could be a person. It could be a living being. It could be a dog. It could be a pet. Whatever. Whatever is a substitute that you depend upon instead of God for whatever your need might be. The thing that takes God's place in your heart, the thing that you depend upon to get whatever you feel you need, you should be looking to God to meet that need. But the things that replace God in our lives are the things we depend upon. That's quickly a definition, I would say, of what idolatry is. So let's go a little bit uh, further. Let's go from a definition of idolatry to an identification of it. Let's get a little more specific because we need to identify specifically what these idols are in a Christian life or in a human life for that matter if we are ever going to be able to avoid them. Interestingly, in the second chapter of 1 John, he talks about worldliness, and he gives three aspects of worldliness, and I think that they really connect with what idolatry is. He talks about the lust of the eye, for example. And I think that this helps us in our identification of idolatry in our life. What are we focused on? The lust of the eye. What creates that a craving after what what do we crave after that we see uh, we need to be careful to both monitor and also set limits on what we look at and what we think about because idolatry has to do with what you're focused on secondly the lust of the eye becomes the lust of the flesh. So what we focus on then gets uh, gets boiled down into desires. The good sometimes the good things that you pursue that uh, that crowd out God, or obviously the evil lusts that you run after, whether they're just in your head and heart or you literally run after them with your feet. Some of the things that we want that displace God, they become idols. Let me name some things that aren't necessarily evil. We want comfort. We want security. We want peace. We want happiness. We want contentment. We want to be loved. We want a sense of fulfillment. We want stability in our lives. Um, we, we want our felt needs, whatever they are, met. We want permanence. We want to health. We want longevity. We want purpose and meaning in our lives. But do you know that all of those things, though they're not sinful in themselves, can become idols when we try to get them from anything or anyone other than God? So that means people can become idols in our lives. Families can be made idols. Good families can be made idols. Romantic relationships can become idols in our lives. Uh, work can become an idol. Uh, other activities, uh, athletic sports can become an idol, obviously. Um, recreation and uh, leisure can become a source of idolatry, money, material things, cars and clothing and food. That's a big one, especially Hagen dazs <laughs> That I'm just joking. We were just talking about how good that ice cream is. It's good ice cream. It's good ice cream. I can't afford it, but it's good ice cream. Anyway, here's a here's a third thing that I think is connected with idolatry. Not only a focus, is how we identify it, a focus 
desires, but thirdly, status, the pride of life, it's called in the context of worldliness. It's the prestige that comes with your achievement where you flaunt what you what you want and you got to wow others. Uh, it gives you a feeling of worth when you're able to impress other people with your trophies, whatever they might be. Status could be your vocation, your career, could be your education, could be your, your uh, social status, could be ministry even. Third and finally, I've had you turn to 1 John 5, 21, and this is where I want to kind of quickly drill down in that, uh, that verse. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. <laughs> idols are all around us. There is a, a invasion that is being waged against your soul. And because of this idolatrous invasion, you ready for this? There has to be an evasion on our part. You have to evade that invasion. You have to avoid it. That's what he's saying here. Keep yourselves, evade this idolatry that is waging an invasion into your soul. Notice what he calls us there in that 21st verse little children. So the evasion of idolatry is a spiritual thing because we're God's spiritual children. We're his little children. You know, you're not like, if you're a believer, you're not like everyone else. You are especially different. You, you're a member of God's family. You are special because you have an exclusive relationship with the creator God that other people don't have. Yes, we're all his offspring, but we're not all the children of God in a spiritual sense. So idolatry is something in the realm of the spiritual. We're his little children. You're his cute, precious little child. You love children? God loves children. And God especially loves his children. He thinks you're cute. I mean, in the right sense. He thinks you're precious. When we sang the song when we were kids, Jesus loves the little children. They're precious in his sight. And they are, but guess what? You're his little children, regardless of your age. And you're precious in his sight. So he says, little children, listen to your daddy. Listen to your Abba. Listen to your father. To evade idolatry is to realize that you are in an extra special spiritual relationship with God. And then... The next uh, couple of words, keep yourselves. This is an evasion of idolatry is not only spiritual, we have to be watchful. Keep yourselves. Literally, be on guard against. Beware of idolatry. Keep your eyes on the subtle idols that are seeking to creep into your soul and put a spiritual stranglehold on your life for God. Be watchful. Keep, be on guard. And then <clears throat> he says, keep yourselves. It's a personal thing. It's a personal responsibility that you have to embrace as an individual believer. You have to take it on. You have to be on your personal guard against idols. In fact, the, the, the phrase, uh, keep yourselves, is in what is called a middle voice, which is an emphasis on your personal responsibility to be actively aware of 
and uh, to beware to keep your eye on how you choose to spend your time, your energy, your ability, your possessions. Beware. Not my words, but I'm going to read this to you. I changed this. This is someone wrote this about worldliness, and I'm changing the word worldliness to idolatry. Okay. I don't know who the person was, but I, that's the credit I'm given. Here, here it is. Idolatry is a passion for sensual satisfaction. It's an inordinate desire for the finer things of life and the self-satisfaction in who we are, what we have, and what we have done. Idolatry, then, is a preoccupation with ease and affluence. It is idolizing creature comfort. Large salaries and comfortable lifestyles become necessities of life. Idolatry is reading articles, books, and watching movies and videos about people who live hedonistic lives and spend too much money on themselves and wanting others to be like them. But more importantly, Idolatry is simply pride and selfishness in disguises. It's being resentful when someone snubs us or patronizes us or shows off. It means feeling pain under every slight, challenging every word spoken against us and cringing when another is preferred before us. Idolatry is harboring grudges, nursing grievance, and wallowing in self-pity. These folks are the idols that John tells us in his closing words of his first letter, where to keep ourselves from. The end.